Today I'm speaking with Drs. Chris McCullough and Ben Gantz. They're researchers at the Faculty of Dentistry at the University of Toronto, and they do research on a wide range of topics, including periodontal regeneration. And I'd like to speak to them today about some of the latest work they've done in this area. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello. Hello, John. Broadly, what's the nature of your research? Well, first of all, John, thank you very much for the, for the chance to explain to uh, Canadian dentists and others um, about the significance and the impact of our work that we've been doing here at the University of Toronto with uh, collaborators Chris McCall and also Ellie Sohn. Um, the, the gist of our work here really is based on the fact that there are currently no effective treatments for periodontal disease. And many of the, the current methods really exhibit uh, significant shortcomings. Um, most of the, the periodontal attachment is lost and uh, cannot be efficiently regenerated in spite of all these advanced procedures. And uh, while some of the current literature suggests that there are specific treatments to achieve partial attachment, um, the amount of regenerated tissue is actually very low. So uh, our research really aims at um, modifying the procedures in certain ways to enhance this initial attachment of periodontal tissues and therefore enhance the regenerative potential. Right. You've got a presentation you, you can show us about, uh, about yes. your work? We've, uh, we've put a little PowerPoint presentation together here. Um, so let me just pull this one up. Okay, so the, the general health problem of periodontitis is just shown here in the first slide and we're really focusing on the left side of this picture here on the attachment of healthy gingiva to the tooth. And if you look at magnified uh, images of this in the healthy conditions, the gingiva are really nicely attached to the uh, cemento enamel junction and then underlying connective tissue attaches to the cementum surface, providing this really nice and tight seal against any oral pathogens. In periodontitis, this seal or this attachment is broken down and really allows not only for the ingression of bacteria, but then for the consequent destruction of tissue, uh, bone uh, resorption or bone degeneration. And if this is not stopped, it will actually uh, eventually lead to the loss of teeth. Now, this is really the clinical problem we're working on. And Chris here is uh, able to give you a few extra slides from the clinic and explain uh, what is being done currently. Here we see John and Ben, a radiograph of a lower first molar with really advanced periodontitis, actually terminal periodontitis, and it displays the loss of uh, bone, it's self-evident I think here, and it also shows the alterations to the root surface. These alterations to the root surface include demineralization of the cementum, often cementum exposure, and biochemical alterations to the root surface, which make it currently impossible to achieve any kind of regeneration. That is the reinsertion of periodontal ligament fibers back into the exposed cementum and the formation of, of new bone. You can see that in this particular instance, there is attachment loss close to the apex on both roots. And based on current approaches that are used clinically, this tooth would be considered terminal and would certainly be extracted which I think is what we see here. The tooth has been removed in a conventional bridge. So the conventional approach for treatment of these types of lesions is just remove the tooth and either put in a bridge or uh, possibly replace it with a dental implant. Now, there are many types of periodontitis lesions that don't necessarily lead to extraction. Here's a class two frication invasion, again, in a lower molar tooth. And with the flap reflected, you can see the extent of the alveolar bone loss, particularly into the frication. This type of periodontitis lesion, where there is opening into the frications, uh, amongst clinicians are probably the most difficult to treat over the long term. Mm -hmm. There's both an infrabony pocket component, that is the top or most coronal element of the, of, the, of the bony wall shown here by the arrow, lies well above the most inferior part of the lesion. So this is what's called an infrabony pocket. And to some extent, it can be treated 
but it has been indicated that the extent of, of regeneration or even repair is very limited. And one of the things that limits it is that following currently used periodontal procedures, and this is a photomicrograph showing on the left-hand side a dentin, and here you've got some epithelial cells which have uh, formed and attached to the uh, exposed root surface of, of a previous pocket. Because of the preparation here used for making the histological slides as an artifactual tear through the uh, long junctional epithelium. But as far as we know, most repair in, in periodontitis lesions that are treated by us leads to the formation of this long junctional epithelium. And the reason that I'm mentioning this is that when you have the formation of a long junctional epithelium, it forms a type of repair, but in no way can there be any significant restoration of lost alveolar bone or lost fibers, the return of fibers back into the tooth. And that's shown here. This shows, again, a fairly low power micrograph of what Sharpie's fibers look like. Sharpie's fibers, again, are the collagen fibers that extend from the bone into the tooth surface, into the, into the surface of the cementum. And it's the reformation of these so-called Sharpie's fibers that is one of the important determinants of what would be actual periodontal regeneration. Right. Now, the, this can happen is shown by a, a clinical case. So here's a, a case, the arrow show the extent, the black arrow show the extent of the, of the bone loss. You can see there's quite a pronounced infrabony component here. S still some granulation tissue in these lesions. But you can see there's really been quite extensive a denudation of, of uh, tooth surface and cementum in some pretty deep pockets. One year later, following a bone graft procedure, you can see that there is certainly the capacity, this is the same case, reopened, re-entry procedure. We certainly have the capacity to get uh, some degree of repair, but exactly as Ben was indicating earlier, this is an unpredictable procedure. And the extent of repair or generation that we get is really kind of up in the air. Here's another clinical example. Here's an infrabony pocket before a regenerative procedure. In this case, the root surface was treated with certain types of chemicals to inspire, or to promote the reformation of, of attachment, new attachment. So this is taken just at the time of the procedure. And then one year later, you can see there's been really quite substantial reformation of, of the pocket. There's the infrabony pocket at the time of procedure, and there's one year later. Now, part of this healing is because the tooth is erupted, but a good proportion of that is actually some kind of regenerative procedure. Now, what do we need to do to reproducibly obtain improve periodontal outcomes. I've listed here some of the absolute mandatory issues uh, for obtaining any kind of successful periodontal healing and hopefully one that would lead to repair. First, I think it's probably self-evident, is the clearance of all pathogens. The second would be the appropriate selection of the types of cells that are gonna to lead to the formation of cementum, periodontal ligament, and bone. The migration of these cells into the wound their specialization is cells that can form cementum, periodontal ligament, and bone, and then ultimately the contraction and the healing of the wound. So this is a fairly high, tall list of orders that, that are needed. Let me pass the baton over to Ben so we can talk more about the current approach that we're working on. Right, so as Chris was uh, summarizing, the, the, the problems with uh, periodontal healing are very often related to a failure of a functional attachment. And this is often being referred to as a race for the surface. And this race for the surface is often won by epithelial cells, which then, in, in consequence, do not provide any functional attachment. And therefore, this, this unpredictability of uh, many procedures. So our general idea here on this picture is we have the cementum of the tooth uh, surface on one side and the gingival connective tissue on the other side, or, or bone, um, and we're trying to achieve a functional reattachment of the two. And uh, so our idea here really is based on uh, research that's been going on in my lab based on uh, enamel-derived proteins. And our idea is, is to use a scaffold or a membrane and uh, modify the surface of this membrane as shown on the left side here in a way that it will induce mineralization 
or direct cementation onto the mineralized tooth surface. Mm -hmm. And this will really then uh, happen very quickly after insertion of this membrane and it will cover the tooth surface with a, a membrane that will then hopefully uh, invite gingival connective tissue cells to invade, to repopulate and to regenerate this tissue. So how far have you progressed with your research? Are you close to the end or are you closer to the beginning? So we just got this grant, when was it? About a year ago. Um, the three of us, we're all approaching different aspects of this study. Um, Ellie Sohn and I are looking at the mineralization side, um, consistent with our expertise and our interests. And Chris is looking at the other side as a cell biologist, has always had an interest in cell migration, wound healing. So what we've begun to do is really look at ways uh, to modify this membrane to really induce this tissue mineralization or this cementation onto the uh, tooth surface. Ellie and I have sort of taken slightly different approaches to that, yet complementary. And uh, Chris is looking on the other side uh, at cell migration. And we have some very interesting preliminary results, which are you know, along with our uh, milestones that were proposed in our in our grants. So oh, it's right on track. Good uh, next steps, where do you hope to take this? And what's the next steps ahead of you? Obviously, the, the next steps are really to solidify the two functional surfaces of this membrane to make sure that not only in vitro, but also in vivo, uh, some animal experimentation will need to be done to verify the functionality on one side to attach to the mineralized tooth surface and then to be able to support repopulation right. by connective tissue cells on the other side. And then last but not least, of course, we need to speak to um, dental organizations, uh, policy makers across Canada to um, garner our next approaches on how to translate this new knowledge to dental practice. Fair enough. Well, we want to keep in touch with you and help you to spread the word. And if you want dentists uh, and anybody in our community to give you guidance or advice or if you seek them we'd be delighted to help you to to get guidance from people that you might want to get in touch with that'd be wonderful thank you john just thank one you. last question what granting agencies uh, are you working with so this is actually a project that has been funded through a combined grant from the canadian institutes of health research cihr and the uh, national uh, Science and Engineering Research Council, and it is a combined project called uh, program called CHIRP, the Collaborative Health Research Project, right. and it is bringing uh, the three of us together with different expertises, Ellie more from the engineering side, Chris clearly from the clinical and cell biology, and me somewhere in between from the biochemistry side. So I think it's a it's a multi uh, pronged approach. Uh, so far, we're, we're quite confident we're going to get somewhere. So a Made in Canada research project uh, to benefit Canadians and others. That's right. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for taking the time for this interview today. And we look forward to catching up with you again soon when you've got more to report. Thank, thank you very you. much, Don.